And everyone said, praise the Lord. We give honor to your pastor and pastor's wife and their family today. Great people of God. Great <laughs> reputation among the people of God. And Brother Elder and I know one another primarily because we hang around the same places, the same watering holes, fellowship the same crowd of people. And uh, we, we uh, are involved with brethren of like precious faith. And so I have from, uh, from those encounters grown to appreciate your pastor and his uh, reputation and his testimony among the brethren. And uh, it's a great, great privilege of ours to be here. And we have come to talk about uh, Apostolic School of Theology or Wilson Pacific University. But we'll do that tonight, I think, if it's good with your pastor. And uh, this morning we'll just have church and uh, I already feel at home and you, you love to worship God and uh, there's, a, there's a crowd an hour before you in Birmingham. They're having church today and when you come to Birmingham, Brother Elder, we can give you barbecue every day and there's a different place to go every day and it's all wonderful. Make your tongue beat your brains out and you just, yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, and I brought my valentine to the house today, and she's been my valentine for 47 years. We've been married 42, but we started hanging out when she was 14 and I was 15. That's a lot of hot fudge cakes ago. And uh, she is my best friend, and I'm so glad to have a companion like this to walk with me through the work of God and in the house of God today and I'm just I feel better when she's around I really do my favorite place you said your favorite place in Birmingham is dreamland my favorite place in Birmingham is my house my second favorite place is new life and uh, my I got other places than dreamland but I'll show you when you come we're glad to have uh, my wife's sister Karen with us today she lives in Fort Collins and her daughter Reagan who's also in well Loveland I guess up in the mountain they're in Loveland these are precious people very familiar with ministry and missions and uh, and uh, I have I have fond memories of Reagan as a three-year-old in Manila and uh, so there's too much to say and too many memories and too far back to reach let's open the word today We're going to be doing an exposition in Isaiah chapter 53 today and looking at the generation of Jesus Christ. We're going to read verse 8 for a text. And if you ever wondered, I don't know who's a visitor and who's home folks today, but if you ever wondered about the sequence of events in the Word of God, and we're going to deal with prophecy tonight in the service. So some of this, we may even launch from uh, Isaiah 53 and 1 for tonight, who has believed our report. But if you've ever wondered about the way that the Word of God develops through the presentation from Genesis to Revelation, as we read Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, we realize that He was a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. And so it lets you know before there was a sin or a sinner or a failure in the garden, before there was a need, God already had the answer. He had the remedy. He had the solution. Before the problem arose, God anticipated the... I want you to know we're in 2016. We're way downstream from all of those biblical events. But I want you to know before you ever bruised your knee the first time before your heart was ever broken the first time before you ever fell into a pit of depression or trouble the first time God already had the remedy for that the devil will tell you something else altogether but I want you to know God already has your answer he's had it from before you were in your mama's womb God had your answer right here today well praise God Isaiah 13, uh, rather 53 and verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. 
for the transgression of my people was he stricken. God bless you. And as you're seated, let's loose ourselves up, open our voices, clap our hands, and give God thanks for his word today. Hallelujah. 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 We give you praise, oh God. We magnify your name, oh God. Hallelujah. Oh, we could go ahead and worship him. We magnify your name, oh God. Mighty God, worthy, worthy God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Appreciate, uh, Brother Elder, the invitation to be here and your vision concerning uh, AST. It's a delight to sit with you on that uh, board of trustees there. Isaiah 53 and verse 1. Who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid our faces as it were our faces from him. We esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him and by his stripes are we healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, but the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he had poured out his soul unto death, he was numbered with the transgressors and bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. If you love his word and you love the message of his word, clap your hands unto him and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And so in this, we read from the 7th century, Isaiah is a prophet 600 plus years upstream of the birth of Jesus, and he is giving us such a great picture uh, of the uh, Christ and the ministry of the Christ and the reason for the Messiah and the whole idea of substitutionary sacrifice before the Lamb of God is ever born in the earth. And so we, we begin with verse 1. Who has believed our report? And we'll probably launch there tonight in a discussion of prophecy. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? This is a couplet. One answers the other. You have to step into the arena of faith. You have to embrace the promise of the word of God. And then you are able to see the arm of the Lord or the manifestation of God or the plan of God for your life. There was a day when Abraham went to a mountain bearing the burden of a, of a heinous commandment from God that he must sacrifice his own son on that mountain to God, the child of promise, the child of his old age. And as he made his way there, you are familiar and so are the Sunday school children 
with the story of how he makes his way up the face of the mountain and there in that mountain enclave as he raises the knife God stops his hand and says now I know that you love the Lord God has to wait for an exercise of faith from you God always lets us participate in the plan many people are waiting on God but I'll just tell you he's God and you're not God is waiting on you you've got to step out into the arena of faith and then as did Abraham Abraham names his mountain Jehovah Jireh in the mountain of the Lord it shall be seen it succinctly it means if you don't make the trip up the mountain of God's commandment you won't see it won't happen it's not coming down to where you are I know we live in a world of fast food and drive through and they have distilled religion and pursuit of God to something like McDonald's but I'm going to tell you sweetheart God's given us a commandment it is settled in his word and you've got a mountain to climb and you've got a you've got a demonstration to make but when you get there it's going to be worth it all because you're going to say Jehovah Jireh in the mountain of the Lord it shall be seen praise God so who believes the report that's to whom the arm of the Lord is revealed the report of the Lord is the word of God the arm of the Lord is God's manifest deliverance or salvation and this is an exercise in the literary device of metonymy this is just like uh, all most of our young men are gone but young man when you when you uh finally build up the courage and you find the right young lady and you do it right and you first pursue it by your pastor and then you pursue it by her daddy and you do him the honor I don't care if he's drunk every Saturday night and never darkened the church door you still go to him and you still pay him honor because that's the way of the word of God now when you go there you might use some archaic phrasing like I would like your daughter's hand in marriage and he would say, well, Ma, bring out the cleaver. There's a fellow here that won't sell his hand. And he's a nice fellow, and we're going to give it to him. Woo. Now, make your way down. The... That wasn't what you were looking for. You want the whole gal. You don't want just the hand. But we all understand it's a literary device. It's metonymy. It's as old as, as Shakespeare and before him. And, and we understand that when we're talking about the arm of the Lord or the hand of the Lord or the right hand of God, we're not talking about a piece or a part of God or some other God. We're talking about a part that speaks of the whole. When we talk about the hand of God, we're talking about all of God behind the hand. When we're talking about the arm of the Lord, we're talking about the, the strength of God manifest in the earth praise God and to whom is the arm of the Lord to whom will God reveal himself by his expressed power in the earth that's the arm of the Lord this is a continuous theme throughout the word of God Psalms 98 and 1 oh sing unto the Lord a new song for he hath done marvelous things his right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. Now, if you believe that the part is separate from God himself, and you ignore the uh, the original premise, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you try to bifurcate God or separate God or multiply the persons in God, then you make a grave scriptural error. But when we're, when we're looking at the hand of God, the arm of the Lord here in the Psalms, do you really believe that the Amalekites were in their encampment and there was this ominous music that began boom, 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 and a hand began to creep across the desert wasteland and up over the dunes and up the craggy faces of the mountains and then down into the Amalekite uh, encampment, smashing their tents and strangling their camels and thumping the little Amalekites all over, snuffing out their fires, and when it's reduced to dust and mayhem the music continues and the hand crawls into the sunset the hand of God you're an idiot if you believe that you got grits for brains I know you guys don't have grits here but no this is a device that means God came down and God let God arise and let his enemies be scattered God came down and his right hand and his whole godliness came upon those enemies of the people 
of God. So his holy arm and his right hand hath gotten him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. So when you read the right hand or the right arm or the hand of the Lord, it's always involved in deliverance, the manifestation of God in deliverance or in salvation. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness hath he openly showed in the sight of the heathen. He demonstrates it. He has great power and he is right. We follow this in the Old Testament and into the New Testament. How often do I witness to people about the manifestation of Jesus Christ in the earth and the fact that he is the manifestation of the only true and living God, the creator God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob come down robed in flesh and they have been preconditioned by the Trinitarian model in the earth and they have been uh, preconditioned to think in certain ways and so they begin to ask questions and the questions are good, the questions are healthy and they say, well, what about Jesus? Jesus at the right hand of the Father. Well, I want you to know God is omnipresent. God is everywhere. David said you can't go anywhere and God's not there. So I want you to understand, though you're bound by space and you're bound by time, and I can get on one side of you, you can't get on the other side of God. You can't stand beside God in the heavenlies or anywhere else because when you're there, he's over there. And when you're here, he's way over there. He's everywhere all at the same time time you say well I can't compute that that's because you're a man and he's God his ways are higher than our ways like the heavens are above the earth but don't make the mistake don't you ever drag God down to your level and make him like a man because he's not he's not bound by time he's eternal he's not bound by space he's everywhere he's not bound by causality he is the cause of everything I'm not going to get very far today. I can see that because we're testing one another out. You're seeing if I can talk about this and I'm seeing how much of this you want to talk about. And we're doing pretty good because we like the word of God, all of us. Everybody in the house likes the word of God. So in the New Testament, Jesus is the right hand of God. By the way, the word hand in all of those Greek expressions there in uh, Hebrews 8 and 1, uh, Hebrews chapter 1 talks about the right, Jesus at the right hand or on the right hand. If you believe it literally, he's on the right hand of the Father. But it's not literal, it's figurative. And the word hand is never there in the Greek. It's always he is at the rights of God. He is the expressed power of God. And so the New Test- in the New Testament... He is the manifestation of God's salvation. The word Jesus is Yeshua. It is God has become our salvation. Praise God. So then the report of the Lord and the hand of the Lord, of the arm of the Lord in verse 1. Verse 2, for he shall grow up before him. And so he then, the arm of the Lord, is a he. Everybody say the arm of the Lord is a he. Praise God. Can you read for me, brother? Okay, just be ready to read, because I may go wandering around, and if I do, I may need somebody to recapture some of this stuff. Okay? For he shall grow up before him, and so the Christ is going to grow up before the Spirit of the living God. The Christ is not preexistent. The Christ, the Son, the Lamb, the earthly, fleshly tabernacle of God has a day of beginning. Now, if you read the Creed of Athanasius or the Nicene Council verdicts or the, uh, the disposition of those who are proponents of the Holy Trinity, you're going to find out that they teach God is eternal, Jesus the Son is eternal, the, God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Ghost. You don't find those phrases anywhere in the Word of God. The Son is the flesh. The Son is the Lamb. In this verse, the Son is the He, and the Spirit of the everlasting God is the Him. You say, well, why does God talk with us about that? Because God is interesting in His, in His behaviors. But again, don't bring Him down to your level. You ascend up into His level. He is taking you like a father with a child, His arm around His shoulder, and He's telling you His story of redemption on the earth, and He's talking about Himself in His manifestation on the earth as though He were a player in a play or a character in a drama. And He's talking about Himself as He projects Himself into the earth. 
earth. You say, well, uh, it makes me feel like there's two of them. Well, you, you got to shake loose your feelings and walk by the word of God. And so he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. He's a tender plant as a root out of dry ground. And so you're walking along and here, boom. And you've got this little, if you've ever seen a root come up out of the ground, first emerging, little white thing and tender and vulnerable and, and looks real weak and really insignificant. And he'll grow up before him as a root out of dry ground. And it seems like, and he's talking about the vulnerability of Jesus Christ or the way that invisible God made himself visible. An untouchable God made himself touchable. An invulnerable God made himself vulnerable. Because before this ticket is over, somebody's going to pulp his lips. And somebody's going to black his eyes. And somebody's going somebody's to gonna crush a crown of thorns into his head. But a little woman with an issue is going to touch his robe. And, and people are going to come and take advantage of the vulnerability of God. And this is a discussion of that. He's a root out of dry ground. But make no mistake about it, that root came from somewhere, and that root is not independent all by itself there. And if you'll just turn around, there is a great and massive tree there behind you that is the whole of God, the plan of God, the, the, the word of God, and all, and all he's showing you here in the Christ is a little tiny fragment of who and what he is. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. He is not, he is not uh, Da Vinci's Jesus. He is not Hollywood's Jesus. He has no form nor comeliness. He's a little skinny Jew. And I don't think he's very pretty at all. The Bible says that it's not. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's an ugly little brown man. He's a little man you wouldn't pay any attention to. But he's the power of God. He didn't come to be born in Rome nor Jerusalem nor in the great cathedrals. He didn't come as a Caesar. He came as a humble carpenter's son so you wouldn't be afraid of him and so that you would see that he had condescended to men of low estate. He came to see about you. This is Jesus' riddle. When the, when the Pharisees were talking to him and trying to trap him and the Sadducees trying to, trying to trap him with their uh, word puzzles, Jesus let them finish and then he would say, this is Matthew twenty two forty two, saying, what think you of Christ? Whose son is he? And they say, the Pharisees say unto him, the son of David. And then Jesus, he saith unto them, how then doth David in spirit Call him Lord. Because you understand, these are all mono, monotheistic Jews. These are Jews that all believe in hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And when they say Lord, they mean the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. There's only one. Matthew, uh, rather Ephesians chapter 4. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who's above. This is pervasive throughout Old and New Testament scriptures. So then how does David in spirit call him Lord if he's his son? Because Lord signifies the God of creation his son signifies something that has come forth from the loins or the the seed of david saying the how doth then david in spirit call him lord saying the lord said unto my lord sit thou on my right hand till i make thine enemies thy footstool he's talking about the tenure of the office of the christ how long is that office going to be open until i make all the enemies of man my footstool if David then call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. But what he had told them, he had told them very plainly. The same thing that Peter would say on the day that the church was born in Acts chapter 2. He said, God has made this same Jesus that you crucified both Lord 
and Christ. He is the God of creation and He has stepped into and become a part of His creation. God has made that same Jesus that you crucified, both Lord and Christ. This is the same refrain as when in John 14, uh, Jesus tells Philip, Philip has asked to see the Father and Jesus tells him, Philip, have I been with you so long and yet you don't know me? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Well, praise God. God. And then, and in another incident with the Pharisees, he's talking about Abraham and the prophets. And finally, in the end of that discussion, he said, before Abraham was, I am. And he lays claim to the voice that came to Moses out of the burning bush. The voice of God spoke with Adam in the garden. The voice of God spoke out of the burning bush to Moses. The voice of God was on Sinai with Moses and Israel. The voice of God all through through the Old Testament, but the voice of God is manifest in the New Testament in the man, Christ Jesus, who has believed our report. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Somebody's got to step over into the arena of faith today and embrace the word of God for what it really says. The arm of the Lord then from that first verse is a he. He is tender. He is vulnerable. He's a root out of dry ground. He is scripturally the root of Jesse. He is the root and the offspring of David. But the root is just a simple manifestation of the whole. Never make a mistake about it. Jesus Christ is God Almighty represented and manifest in the earth. When we see Him, there's no beauty that we should desire Him. No flesh is ever going to glory in His presence, even His own flesh. He would not even allow His own flesh to be glorified. He is not going to be a Hollywood Jesus because the work He came to do was going to be brutal work. The work He came to do was the work of your redemption. It was going to be hard work. It was going to be nasty work. It wasn't going to be accomplished by some prima donna. It was going to be accomplished by somebody that would get down in the trenches where the people were and where your sins are. Verse 3, he's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. The arm of the Lord is a man. We're walking through Isaiah 53, the arm. The Lord is a man. But what a paradox. This is the arm of the Lord, the manifestation of God for deliverance and salvation. But the arm of the Lord is despised and rejected. Isaiah is speaking for Israel now. He's speaking. He's the voice of the entire nation. A man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. This is a tremendous paradox. Here's our hero. He's our hero. He's come to deliver us. But he's a man of sorrows. And acquainted with grief. He ought to be the center of every celebration. He ought to be worshipped everywhere he would go. People ought to fall on their faces before him. And thank God for his redemption. And for his salvation. But he's a man of sorrows. And acquainted with grief. And Israel says we hid as it were our faces from him. Praise God. Everybody wants salvation. But nobody wants to really see how it's made. Everybody wants to be saved, but nobody wants to get down into the gore of the Word of God or really make a trip to Golgotha and really see the power. You want me to give you a straight up like a jolt to your chin from a strong right? You want to hear the Word of God? Hereby we perceive the the love of God that He laid down His life for us. You want to know how much God loves you? God came to the earth. God robed Himself in flesh. And God laid down His life for you. The theologians have a problem with that because they say... Ah, you believe that God died, and and that's a problem because God can't die. Oh, really? The Bible said he did. Shake yourself, bring yourself into, into sync with the Word of God. But if I use you for an example today, would you be an object lesson for me? Anybody here got concealed carry? Yeah, it's like you never know. So, so just for the object lesson's sake, is this okay? You got insurance? Oh, this is not good then. You don't have insurance. Million dollars at least on this guy, you know? Okay, so 
right now. Living, breathing, sentient, alive. Okay. Boom. 44 goes through there. The whole pan, well, I'm not going to get into the graphic details, but it's, you don't want to be sitting here when we do this. But immediately, like a puppet whose strings have been cut, that body's gone. I mean, in a nanosecond, there is nothing there. It is not recognizable as life anymore. You, however, what's your name? Luis. Uh, you, however, hermano Luis, you don't miss a step. You feel an immediate release. You are absolutely free. It's the first time in your ex existence you've been free of that earth earthbound body. And it's exhilarating. Whether you're saved or lost, it's exhilarating for a moment. But as it was in Luke 16, the rich man died, left his body in the earth, and lifted up his eyes in hell. And begins to talk to God or Father Abraham and say, Send Lazarus, who was a poor man who died in the same story, and he's in heaven. And the rich man's in hell. But neither of them lose consciousness. They don't, they don't lose anything about themselves. He said, matter of fact, send Lazarus that he might dip his finger, still thinking in terms of digits and tongues, dip his finger in water, still thinking about water, that he may touch my tongue because I am tormented in these flames. He still knows who he is. He knows who Abraham is. He knows who Lazarus is. He's still the same person. You understand what I'm telling you? Death is not an end. It's not a cessation of being. Death, that's why they say God can't die. But they, what they mean is that God can't cease to be. You don't cease to be, sweetheart. And when we pull the trigger on you, you just keep right on going. You just start moving toward your eternal reward, either into the bosom of Abraham or down into the pit of hell. And wherever you go, it will not end. Don't ever think, oh my, if suicide ever gets breathed into your spirit, you better stop and go back to the word of God and understand that it won't stop your pain and it won't stop your being but you're going to be dealing with eternal realities you understand what I'm saying praise God so so uh, he is he is God hanging on the cross he is God that sheds that earthly body and God, when the Spirit leaves that body, it is God leaving that body. And it is a dead body hanging on the cross. And He sets the timer. And He's going to raise it up in three days. He is our substitutionary sacrifice. Are you okay? Verse 4. Surely He has borne our griefs. Oh, this is our hero. This is the manifestation of the deliverance of God. He's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. You know there's people that take a bottle of pills for their grief and for their sorrows, but when they come back down again, their sorrow's still there and their grief is there. Grief is like a stone in your heart and sorrow's like a crushing weight. But I'm glad to tell you that God came down to shoulder up under your grief and shoulder Shoulder up under your sorrows. He's our hero. He makes all the difference. Is there a witness in the house? Is there anybody here that can say, He's borne my griefs. He's carried. Oh, let's just stop for a minute and praise Him. He's borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. Yet, and here's that continuous developing paradox throughout this passage. This, this irony that is building. This conflict kind of is pressing in both directions at the same time. Yet, this is the hinge that it swings on here. We did esteem him stricken. He's our hero, but he's stricken. He's our, he's our burden bearer, our sorrow bearer, but he's stricken, smitten of God, not smitten of the devil, not smitten of Pilate, not smitten of, let me, let me tell you, and, and you understand it straight up, the cross was not Rome's plan. The cross was not the devil's plan. It, for, for a fact, Paul says, 
to the church at Corinth. If they had known who he was, they'd have never crucified the Lord of glory. If they had known what was about to break loose in their little kingdom, they'd have, they'd have said, don't touch him. Leave him alone. Kill that soldier with the sword. Knock that guy down with a hammer and the nails. Don't let anybody touch Jesus. As long as he's alive, everything's going to be all right. That was or would have been the voice of hell there. But he is a paradoxical character. And he is smitten of God and afflicted. The idea of the substitutionary sacrifice is all through the word of God. It begins in the garden with Adam and Eve and God instead of killing them, God kills an animal and rips those skins off those animals. My mama used to threaten to skin us alive. It was a horrible contemplation. But God did. The fury of God. The judgment of God was there. And the mercy of God was there. And there was a conflict that was there in the garden. And he, he found, and I'll just about guarantee you, I Nobody knows, but I'm going to tell you, I believe it was a lamb that he found in the garden and ripped the skins off of it because the lamb has been the chosen sacrificial emblem all the way through the word of God. The idea of substitutionary sacrifice is deep in the Jewish psyche. And so they are getting this or they should have gotten this as Isaiah is teaching. When John introduces Jesus in John chapter 1, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He identifies Jesus Christ. He is the herald of the Savior. This is he of whom I said after me come Cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. This is some more of that he and him, lion and lamb, father and son language. He said, in the natural, he's my cousin, and I'm six months older than him. And he is after me. He comes after me. His ministry starts after me. But he was before me. And he's talking about the God of the ages. He was before me, and he is preferred before me. And this is woven all through the word. Of God, And this is another riddle, if you would. God's plan now presents his arm, the man, the, as the substitutionary sacrifice of Israel. The arm of the Lord lifts our griefs and buries our, carries our sorrows. He's our, he's our hero, but he's a paradoxical figure. He's a contradiction. He's an irony. Our, our hero is smitten of God. And it's... It's like our hero is smitten of God. And it's like a left jab. Bam. Which is not going to take you down. But it's going to set you up. And the right cross is coming next. And after the right cross. I find myself laying flat on my back. Eyes wide to a starry sky. And I get a a revelatory piece of information. He was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace the reason that God smote him the reason that they crucified him the reason that he came down and became vulnerable and touchable and killable the reason that he did that he was wounded for my transgressions he was bruised for my iniquities the chastisement of my peace I'm personalizing this my peace was upon him and by his stripes I am healed and so I'm laid out now and the word of God has just cleared the deck with me and I'm sprawled out before God seeing the majesty of the Christ and the reason and the victory of God and the fact that he came and bore the burden and paid the price and I could and I want to thank him and I want to praise him I want to thank God for salvation and I want to praise God for his mighty war arm and I want to thank God for coming down on the earth as a as a coming little brown man and that nobody loved and nobody would have valued in his physical presentation I just want to thank God for stepping down and condescending to men of low estate and I want to say thank God for his mighty arm but I'm feeling the pain paradox now and I'm feeling the irony now it it was because of my transgressions it was because of my sins it was because of what I am and what I've done his beating purchased my peace and his stripes and that healing that we experience in this house today 
is because they tied him to a post and broke out a Roman cat of nines and tore his back to shreds. That Roman cat of nines was laced with bone and metal and that alone could kill a man. His blood pressure dropped out of the bottom. He lost copious amounts of blood when they were when they were strapping him with that, with that Roman whip, he bought my healing there. Anybody in this house testify to the healing of God? Has he ever come down in the middle of the night and lifted you up out of your, out of your sickness? Has he ever healed anybody? I want you to know the devil says no and the cynic says never, but I'll tell you the healing of God is as real today as it's ever been. If you'll believe the report of the Lord, you can see the arm of the Lord and this is part of what what he's promised if you'll believe his report you can receive the power of it today verse 6 you want to read that brother just so they'll get i'm getting monotonous here let them hear another voice when you started singing i thought you sing like the pastor I all know. we like sheep have gone astray every one of us has gone astray like a sheep you know, he likens us to sheep, and sheep are dumb. It's not flattering when God calls you a sheep. Sheep can roll on their back and die. Can't get up. Can't figure it out. Sheep don't have any means of defending themselves. They're just pitiful little things. And he said, you're, you're like a sheep. And look at your neighbor and say, meh. Read on. Read on. We have turned everyone to his own way. Every one of us has turned. I had a young man in the house the other day that said, he was upset with me because I had everybody in the house pray a prayer of repentance. Because I said, and I said it for the benefit of our visitors, there's nobody here but sinners. Everybody in this house is a sinner. There's only two kinds of people in the world. Sinners that are not under the blood and sinners that are under the blood. But there's only one kind of humanity. And that is that we are all sinners in the earth. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone into his own way. We are so insufferably self-centered. Read on. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Out of our insufferable ego and our sin and our selfishness, God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But the punchline of this story, if, you've, if you're familiar with the prince and the pauper or any of those other uh, stories like that, you understand as you get into this story, which is broader than Isaiah 53, that God speaks about that arm of the Lord as a third person or as another person. But he's talking about himself as a character in the drama of salvation. He has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Read, uh, he is our scapegoat. He is our Passover lamb. He is our lamb of atonement. Verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He didn't say a word. Well, what could he say? He didn't say. Pilate was astonished that he wouldn't defend himself. But what could he say? What could he say? The only thing he could have said was, I'm not here for myself. I'm here for Louise. The, the blame, the fault is not on me. It's on you. He came down for every one of us. And he didn't blow his cover. He kept his mouth shut. It drove Pilate crazy because Pilate wanted to get him out of there. He didn't want to deal with that. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And I'm following him across Jerusalem and I'm watching this unfold. And he doesn't, he doesn't say a word about who he is or why he's come because what he has proposed from before Adam and Eve is that he would be a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth and now he's in real time in the moment and now the thing is about to take place and he's not going to blow it and he's not going to reveal it because the, the devil himself would have stopped the thing had he known who he was and what he was about to do 
He is our scapegoat. He is the lamb that Israel took out of the herd and brought. And all the elders laid their hands on him. And then a good man led him out into the wilderness and loosed him with all the sins of Israel upon his head. He is the scapegoat. He is the lamb of atonement. Leviticus 16. The one time of year the high priest could go into the holy of holies. And he is that chosen, special, perfect lamb. No spot, no blemish. He never sinned. Not one moment moment not one day of his life he was the second man Adam and he did it right and his blood was going to go into the heavenly holy of holies and was going to be sprinkled he is our lamb of atonement he is crucified on Passover but all the Passovers before they were just preliminaries they were just foreshadowings all the Passovers before from Moses all the way down to Calvary were just telling the story of the lamb that was to come all the day of atonements all the Yom Kippur's before they were just prophetic announcements of one day there's going to come a perfect lamb and this is all going to be over and the price for sin is going to be paid and he is the lamb of atonement and he is the scapegoat and he is our Passover lamb he's the good shepherd and he's the sheep he's the lamb he doesn't he doesn't reveal himself in these encounters. And it's consistent with a theme throughout the Word of God. He's always revealing and hiding. He's always disclosing and shielding. On the way out of, on the way out of Egypt... It is light and darkness like it was in the creative. He separates the light from the darkness. It's, uh, it's the business of no one knows what's going to happen and the whole world is in darkness concerning the plan of God. When they're there with Moses, the Bible says it was the same tower of cloud and fire. And to these it was light and to those it was darkness all the night. And they came one not near the other all the night. It's a mysterious and powerful thing, but we find it later throughout the word of God it's in the parables he hides the truth but only a little bit so if you're hungry you dig around and you find it with ease but if you're not hungry for God you don't find it so for one it's open and it's light and it's disclosure for another one they just walk right by it how many walk by him and never realized he was the power of God in the earth how many are walking by him today in Pueblo and they say ah just another church just another Sunday just another song about Jesus Jesus is just all right with me Jesus is just all right oh yeah and it's hidden and it's disclosed all at the same time and as he's walking had you known Isaiah 53 had you known the prophecies of the word of God somebody would have seen him and known who and what he was Praise God. Praise God. We speak, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He's making his way. You know where he's going? He's going down into the grave. Death is about to come and embrace him. But little does death know that it's about to be embraced. He's about to go down into grave. And grave is just nonchalant. It's been swallowing people for these thousands of years. And here's just another Jew on another cross. It's just another day. But little does he know that a virus is coming. That a stealth bomber is about to fly into him. Little does he know that there's a depth charge chained to this man he's about to embrace. And the door of hell is about to be blown off his hinges. And the door of the grave is about to be destroyed. And death is going to be maimed and never the same again. It's going to happen here and he's just he's just got his lips kind of quiet and closed and he knows the secret by my by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many he knows what's about to happen but he's not telling anybody he is he is the answer to the redemptive dilemma he is a charge The Bible says he led captivity captive. He's going to overcome death. 
and hell and the grave. He's going to make a show of them openly. When he's, there, when he's there on the cross, he sets the timer. And it's set for three days. And he says, this is about to get interesting. And they're going to take him down. And Joseph of Arimathea is going to wash carefully his body. And they're going to roll him up. And everybody's going to scatter from the cross. And the disciples are in bewilderment. And his mother and the other Marys are weeping. And nobody really knows. But the timer's just ticking. And the day of resurrection is going to come. And it's going to be a Monday morning. A Sunday morning rather. And it's going to be a day that changes the arc of human experience. It's going to change everything. Read verse 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. Yeah. Who's going to declare his generation? This is your son, right? I noticed this morning kind of sings like you. Does he look like you or looks like his mama? Good deal. <laughs> Isn't that a blessing? <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, I'm stepping into family stuff. Watch out. I'm stepping back. Okay. Extricate myself. Uh, but who shall declare his generation simply means who's going to look like him? There won't be. An old granny that comes and puts her hand on the head of a little six-year-old and says, you look just like your daddy Jesus. Nobody's going to say, you remind me of him. You look like... Nobody's going to sit around the table and tell his stories. Nobody's going to sit around the fire and sing his songs. Because he's cut off out of the land of the living. And who shall declare his generation and there's a finality there. And there's this lament there that he's cut off. That he won't have any progeny. He's cut down in his prime. And nobody will ever look like him and carry on his name and know him. But read the next verse. For the trans... And, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. He made his grave. Because nobody he had, else made it. And he chose to be buried with the wicked and with the rich. Go ahead. Because he had done no violence. And it wasn't, you understand the, the ironic nature of this language. He made his grave with the, with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Because no deceit was found in his mind. You would think he'd be buried with them because he had been a sinner. Because he buried with the sinners where the sinners go. And he's a sinner so that's where he ought to go. But it's the very fact that he was not a sinner. Within the scope of God's plan. That is the reason he's buried with them. He walks with them. He lives with them. He ministers to them. He dies with one on one side. And one on another. And then he goes down to their grave. But this is not the plan of Rome. And this is not the plan of the Sanhedrin. This is the plan of God. And he goes there because. He doesn't have sin. God wants to put him right there in the middle of them. Down into hell he goes. Down into the grave he goes. And he's going to blow the doors off of all of it. Read on. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. This is God's pleasure. It pleased the Lord. People around the cross are crying. You sing those old songs today and people cry. But this was the pleasure of God. This was the plan of God. This is a wonderful day in the overview of God's plan for mankind. This is a day of victory. This is a day of celebration. Because the chains are about to be broken. And the darkness is about to be lifted. And man is about to be set free from the thousands of years of bondage to sin. Read on, read on. He hath put him to grief. He put him to grief. This is the pleasure of the Lord to put this body to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. When you offer him up for an offering. He shall see his seed. I beg your pardon? He shall see his seed. What? He shall see his seed. You mean when you kill him, he's going to see his seed? Read that again. He shall see his seed. This is lunacy. How are you going to see his seed when he's dead? He's dead. He ain't going to have no seed. He was 
cut off from the land of his living of the living who shall declare his generation but he said when when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin he shall see his seed he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand when this happens on the cross he's going to have some babies when this happens on the cross the pleasure of the Lord is going to be revealed and he's going to prosper good things are going to come out of that cross revival is going to come out of that cross children are going to come out of that cross offspring are going to come out of that cross a church 2,000 years later in Pueblo, Colorado is going to rise up out of that cross read on, read on, read on he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied he'll see the travail of his soul and be sorry he'll see the travail of his soul and be so sad He'll see the, and the travail, the travail, the travail. It is agony, but it is a word that is so strongly associated in childbearing. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. What is he doing there on the cross? He's giving birth. What's he doing on the cross? He's having babies. What's he doing? Come on. They went to Pilate. They said, look, the sun's about to set. We got to get these bodies off the cross for we are holy people. And the, and the word of God has this mandate back in Deuteronomy that we got to get them off the cross before sundown because the whole land will be cursed. And because cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. And those righteous Pharisees, they said, we got to get this done because we are men of the word. But they didn't know who was hanging on the cross in front of them. They went to Pilate. Pilate said, yeah, sure, do it. So they went and they, they put spears in the legs of the thieves and broke their knees and broke their legs and they collapsed. And that's how you die on the cross. You die of suffocation. You die of oxygen deprivation. And the only way to get enough air is to stand up on the nails and breathe but then your legs are contorted and then they tear the muscles tearing one against the other so much that you're probably black by the time it's over because your musculature is tearing itself and hemorrhaging beneath the skin and when you can't stand it anymore you collapse upon those nails in your wrist but then the process begins again and you can't breathe and you got to have some breath so you bring yourself up on the cross and it is a message from Rome don't transgress the laws of Rome and it's a public execution and and uh, he wasn't crucified with that little white thing on that, that all the pictures and all the artists demonstrate. He was hanged naked before everybody in open humiliation and ridicule. And when they came to Jesus, they were going to break his legs so that he would suffocate. But he was already gone. He had already cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me he had already cried out to John man behold your mother woman behold your son he had already cried out to fulfill the scripture I thirst he had already said father forgive them do you know how much it how much energy it took to get those phrases spoken and most of them were directly tied to prophecy and he wouldn't leave one verse unfulfilled so much so that the Roman soldier beside him said, truly, this was the Son of God. Now, for you, if you think that Roman soldier got converted there, you don't understand the template of history. That was a Roman soldier. He didn't believe in Jesus. Christianity hadn't even started yet. So the Son of God to him meant a son of the gods. He said, this man is like Hercules. Look at what he's doing. He's pulling up on those nails. And he's crying out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, la max sabathana. And the Roman soldier said, he is like Hercules. He's a son of the gods. He was impressed. But when, when they came to Jesus, they wanted to make sure. So they got on the left side and they plunged that spear in his side. And as they did, the scripture said, forthwith came blood, which is good. You get plunged in your heart. You're supposed to have good, rich, healthy blood. Like if we use you for an object lesson today, you got a knife? No, fifth rib and all that, and I ought to just get, I ought to just get covered with. That's a pump in there, and it doesn't have sense enough to know it ought to stop. You make a hole in it, it just starts throwing blood everywhere, you know. And, but I wouldn't get any water with you. I just get all blood. But with Jesus, they got water because he was dying of oxygen deprivation, 
And he was having system failure. And his heart was having conge- con- uh, congestive heart failure. And in his pericardium was this, this, this watery buildup. And it was all around that pump. And now his pump is pumping. It barely can do its job. And, 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 and they put that spear in his side. And water and blood come forth. And, and I don't want to be gross. And I know it's Sunday morning. And it's not any good time to talk about all this. But that it's like the birth process. And water and blood. And the water and the blood are mixed together. And it's oh so very like baptism. Where the water and the blood are mixed together. And it's so very like birth. When the water and the blood are mixed together. And he shall see the travail of his soul. And the word travail has to do with giving birth. He said after you made his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. And the church was born on a rocky mountain face. Outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, when blood and water came out of the side of the Savior, of the Lamb, of the, of the, the arm of God manifest in the earth. Praise God. From the garden all the way down to our day, there's been this ferocious conflict. It is resolved at the cross because God is a just God and a righteous God. And justice demands payment for sin. But God is also a merciful God. The mercies of God endure forever. And these two insurmountable qualities of God were in friction there in the garden. And all the way down through the substitutionary story of the New Testament. And then, and then at the cross they collapsed. And mercy, the Bible says justice and mercy, righteousness and justice. Several ways you can express it have kissed. They have come together. And on the cross, God's justice is satisfied because something perfect died for the sin of all the world. And His mercy is satisfied because people are set free from the bondage of sin. Let's stop for a moment, clap our hands unto Him and bless His name. He said, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. And he talks about in plain language how he's borne the sins of all of these. You know, it's amazing that the old old rabbis missed this and that Israel missed this. They should have been able to open this up. And I'll tell you what they should have seen. They should have seen that in the moment when he cried out, Eli, Eli, lamach sabachthani, or my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? They should have known what was happening in front of them. But as it's recorded, one of them said he calls on Elijah. Another one said he calls on God. They wagged their heads and they said he calls on God. Let's see if God will save him. Seeing that he trusted in him. They had no idea that both Jesus and they were speaking from a script that had been written a thousand years before. For in Psalms 22... And in that day, there, there was no Psalms. There was no 22, 23. It was all just constant flow of Scripture. But if you wanted someone to read in a certain place, you gave them a heading just a little bit beyond or above where you wanted them to read. And so in this day on the cross, Jesus chooses to give the whole crowd there the, the beginnings of something David expressed in Psalm, what we call Psalms 22. And he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If you would have been at the cross and had access to your Bible or to the scroll, you could have opened up the scroll and you could have said, he's not calling on anyone. He's quoting scripture. Let's see what the scripture says. And he says, and as we begin to read, as it is with prophecy quite often, The prophet may not even know that he's prophesying. And so as you're reading in what we call the 22nd Psalm, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then why are you so far from the words of my roaring? And in this prophetic script, we begin to see that Jesus is quoting David, but somewhere in the flow, it ceases to be David speaking. And it begins to be the Christ hanging on the cross speaking. I'm starting in verse 6. But I am a worm and no man. A reproach of men 
and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They say, they shake the head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him. And that's exactly what they said at the foot of the cross. What you're reading here is the prophecy of David from a thousand years before. Verse 14, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. His wrist, his elbows, his shoulders have slipped out of joint. He is there and he is coming apart on the cross. My heart is like wax. It is enveloped in water and it can barely beat. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. He is dehydrated. His kidneys are failing. His tongue is swollen in his mouth. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me to the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. They call the Gentile soldiers dogs. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They call the Sanhedrin the assembly of the wicked. They pierce my hands and my feet. I don't know how you can correlate any of this with David, but in this passage, they pierce my hands and my feet. We are shockingly in the middle of something that David never experienced and David never had perpetrated against him. He said, somebody's getting their hands and feet pierced. If you would have had that scroll at the foot of the cross, you would have said, I'm reading a thousand year old prophecy fulfilled right in front of my eyes. They pierce my, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. He was crucified completely naked. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. They are down at the foot of the cross. He has a seamless robe. The soldiers don't want to cut it and share the fabric. So they cast lots. They gambled for it. This never happened to the man David. But this happens to our Jesus as he's hanging on a cross. It is clear that Psalms 22 is about the cross. It never happened to David. But because of the cross on down in the 22nd Psalm. Ye that fear the Lord, praise Him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify Him. And fear Him, all the seed of Israel. Because of the cross, verse 26, the meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek Him. Your heart shall live forever. Because of the cross, verse 27, all of the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before Thee. Because of the cross, a seed shall serve him everybody say a seed shall serve him the question in the in the in the passage of Isaiah is who shall declare his generation but the answer for that is embedded not only in Isaiah 53 but it's embedded 300 years before Isaiah in Psalms 22 a seed shall serve him and it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation he's going to give birth on the day that his hands and feet are pierced he's going to give birth on the day that they gamble for this God He's going to give birth on the day that they wag their heads and say, He saved others. Let him save himself. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. That he hath done this. And so he's projecting out from the cross. He said there are going to be a lot of them born. For 2,000 years. Men and women have been going down in the water in Jesus' name. If you're here today and you don't know what it means to be born again, Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, you must be born of the water and of the Spirit. That means you must be baptized in the water in the name of Jesus Christ. And you must receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You'll know when you get it because you'll speak as they spoke in the Word of God in other tongues or other languages. It will revolutionize your life and you will be born. You will be a generation accounted unto the Lord the seed of God born in the earth of the water and of the spirit somebody say praise the Lord who shall declare his generation that's a question it, re it requires an answer who shall declare his generation if you kind of get this today you ought to be saying I will 
I, I will. I'm his seed. I'm his generation. I'm born of the water. I'm born of the spirit. I'm born of that moment on the cross. I'm born by his infinite love and mercy. I came out of the side of the Savior when he was wounded on that day. Somebody say praise the Lord. Who is that? Who is that seed that's going to serve him? Is there a seed of God in this house today? Is there a seed that say, I'll declare him. I'll serve him. Who is that that's going to declare him unto a people that shall be born? I'll do that. And who's going to tell his story around the table? And who's going to carry on his name? He was cut off out of the land of the living, you know. And is somebody going to come and pat you on the head and say, well, you're looking like your heavenly father more and more. Every day, you're sounding like him. You're looking, you remind me of that Jesus that I read about. And you say, that's my daddy. That's my heavenly father. My heart is to look more like him, to live more like him, to sound more like him, to glorify him. Praise God. Praise God. (laughs) Let's stop for a minute. Just lift our hand and love him and thank him. Whatever's in your heart right now, just begin to give it to him. Tell me the story of Jesus Right on my heart, every word Tell me the story most precious, sweetest That ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus. Sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest. Peace and good tidings on earth. Tell me the story. Tell me again. Of Jesus. I want to hear it. Right. I never get tired of this. On my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious sweetest that ever was heard tell of the cross where they nailed him he was writhing in anguish and pain tell of the grave where they lay him but tell me how he liveth again hey somebody sing tell me the story of jesus this altar's open if you'd like to come would you ride on my heart every word if you don't know him today this would be a good day tell me that story most precious sweetest that ever was heard this is my favorite part of the whole song love in that story so tender clearer than ever I see stay let me weep while you whisper love paid the ransom for me Somebody tell me who will declare the generation, the story. Uh, who's going to tell the story? Jesus, right on my heart, every word. 
Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Hey, tell of the cross where they nailed him. He was writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they lay him. But tell me how he lived again. Somebody just love him and praise him. If you're here and you never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, God will fill you with His Spirit today. If you're a backslider in the house and somehow you've lost your way, make your way back to Calvary. He died for sinners. He died for me. He died for you. He'll cover you by His blood today. Yes, He will. If you just need to be born again today of water and spirit, all that can happen in this house today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. He came to earth for you. He came looking for you. He knows you by name. He knows everywhere you've been and everything you've done. And he loves you more than all of those things. He shed enough sacrifice there to cover. You can't, you can't tell me that you've fallen too far. God's love and God's mercy can reach you where you are. God can cover you. There's not a thing in your life that the blood of Jesus can't cover. There's not a thing in your life that the mercy of God can't overcome.